and welcome to the rollout of our Building Cleaner Faster report. I'm Greg Gershuni, the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. For 51 years, the Energy and Environment Program has worked at the intersection of nature and human civilization to find solutions to the greatest problems facing both. Anticipating the Biden administration's proposals for urgent economy-wide action on climate change, the Energy and Environment Program convened a group of policymakers, experts, and practitioners to consider solutions to expedite climate action. Over a series of three roundtable conversations at the end of 2020 and into the beginning of 2021, this group of experts focused on the following problem. Achieving net zero emissions by 2050 is ecologically essential, technologically feasible, economically achievable, but procedurally impossible. To put it another way, even though there are or will be soon less expensive than greenhouse gas emitting infrastructure, the technologies we need like zero emissions electricity generation, including wind and solar, the enabling infrastructure like transmission, transportation decarbonization infrastructure, and the advanced manufacturing and industrial facilities needed for a decarbonized economy can take years and years to build because of the process currently in place. We are fortunate to have as co-chairs for these conversations, two former chairs of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, Jim Connaughton, who served under President George W. Bush, and Katie McGinty, who served under President Bill Clinton. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Katie now to offer a walkthrough of the report, its findings and themes. Here you go, Katie. Well, thanks, Greg, and thanks to uh, everyone who's joining in with us today. It's really a pleasure to be able to share with you some of the highlights uh, of this truly extraordinary working group of people who embraced the challenge of decarbonization and came up for, with great ideas as to how we could accelerate our way forward. Uh, I wanna start with a shout out and a, a, a thank you, a special thank you to my co-chair, Jim Connaughton, who Jim really did uh, have the laboring oar on this report. And I'm very grateful to him for his stewardship of the, uh, of the work here. Uh, I also want to say that it was an amazingly diverse group of experts that came together to pitch in and help us come up with ideas around this urgent challenge. Scientists, uh, investors, policy experts, developers of green and renewable energy projects, uh, legislators and leaders from federal, state and local government, and we were especially honored to be joined uh, by two members of Congress who pitched in absolutely 100%, Congressman Sean Kasten uh, and Paul Tonko, and they made just an, an enormous contribution to the work and to the conversation that uh, we were wrestling with. Now, when we brought this team of people together, it was really with two key imperatives in mind. Um, first, that action to tackle climate change really is of urgent importance. Everybody agreed to that. The second common shared view was that, geez, the, the stars have never been more aligned to drive climate action. Investors are hugely engaged and insisting on action. Governments in the United States and around the world are acting and insisting that we raise the bar in terms of taking on the climate challenge. And at the same time, the private sector uh, has stepped up now uh, way more than half of the S&P 500, for example, have made uh, very robust commitments to reducing their own emissions, to helping their customers reduce their emissions, and also calling on their suppliers, for example, to have strong climate and sustainability scores before they'll even consider doing business with them. So the stars are aligned for action. However, even in the face of that forward momentum, a big wall, a big hurdle presents. And that is the wall of the countless reviews and permits and delays and time required around federal, state, and local uh, reviews of projects. How can we take this on? That's the, the, the issue that drove our conversation. 
And as Greg teed up, we really uh, came around an insight that action is indeed, we know it's ecologically essential. We know now that the price curves on decarbonization technology have come down dramatically. So it's technologically feasible to go after that net zero objective uh, as the Paris Accord and as scientists have told us. We also know that it's economically achievable, but huge significant upside as we move to cleaner energy resources. I'll say for my own company, as we have moved towards 100% renewables, we're saving money from our electricity bill. We're, we're able to have certainty as to what the price points will be for our energy usage on a go forward basis. So all of that is in the positive. At the same time, however, the processes and the procedures are causing many, many, many essential projects to either sit on the sidelines or finally to get canceled because of the cost involved in uncertainty and delay. So our group came up with essentially five key insights that we think can help, not the whole solution, but we think can help drive more progress. And they go like this. So first, when you have one, a project that genuinely will drive down carbon, so a decarbonization project, that second is to be built on a property that already has been developed uh, and or on a property where maybe government and local actors have pre-zoned that property for clean and renewable energy development. Well, that's a category of project that should, for all practical purposes, be pre-approved, automatically able to move forward. Second, a variation on that theme. If it's a project that will drive decarbonization, this is a project good for the planet, number one. But second, maybe it is not being built in an area that was already developed, or maybe there is some unique additional environmental impact that that project might have. Well, there, there should be pre-approval as it relates to the project but then very limited and time bound review of just that unique environmental impact. So just two quick examples, going back to the first, the kind of pre-approval automatically approved category, imagine a solar farm on an old coal plant, the decommissioned coal plant. That should just be approved right out the gates. An example of the second might be that same solar farm being built somewhere where there might be a wetlands impact. Okay, limited time bound review to see if that wetlands impact can be minimized. So those were two of our core ideas that we came up with in our report. A third key insight is we really have to align the key actors here. So federal, state and local governments aligned in this objective of trying to get decarbonization infrastructure built so that we can get that net zero. And here we did put forward ideas of some carrots and sticks that would be involved so that those state and local actors would prioritize accelerating these projects as well. Now there's precedent for this as well. If you look at the Surface Transportation Act, for example, there always have been um, uh, provisions there that look for environmental performance in order to unlock federal dollars towards the states. So that was the third key priority for us. Fourth, well, it won't do us any good if we get the permits very quickly, but then if there is endless um, opportunity for court challenge and all kinds of battles. So we do believe that people have to have the right to be able to have a review of a project, but we think it's imperative here that that review be limited in scope and also time bound. And I'll come back to it, but there are plenty of examples of judicial processes where we as a country have said, 
yes, there will be judicial process, but it will be again, limited in scope and limited in, dur in duration. Fifth and of uh, high, high importance to our group, this is the time and the opportunity to change environmental burden into environmental opportunity. And we had some brilliant ideas about ensuring equity come uh, to the fore. And some of those ideas were kind of playing on the word equity. Let's move forward in ways that some jurisdictions like Washington DC and elsewhere are moving where there is actual ownership stake granted to local communities to enable um, that kind of full participation in the decision making, in the shaping of the project, and then certainly in the economic upside of that project. A variation on the theme of this idea of ensuring equity takes a page from the Telecommunications Act uh, where there are fees that are put in place, for example, in that instance, to enable the more widespread build out of broadband even in lower income or uh, disadvantaged communities. We take a page from that book and say, let's try that here as well, so that the clean energy future is a future that all communities will have a chance to participate in. So pre-approval of projects that decarbonize and that are in places that are being redeveloped or pre-zoned for that purpose, very limited review of decarbonization projects where there might be a unique uh, additional impact that should be looked at, quick judicial review, engaging uh, state, local, and federal in an aligned fashion, and finally making sure that all members of our community can participate. We think these ideas would enable us to do that ecologically imperative, that technologically feasible, that economically achievable objective of net zero and actually get it done, not get wrapped up and stopped in red tape. Last couple of things I just wanted to share uh, to give some additional parameters of what uh, the team put, put together. So first, we are solving here for permit delays and, and uncertainty and the economic impact of projects that come with all of that. We are not calling for any rollback of the environmental standards themselves. And we think in fact that's uh, absolutely unnecessary. This is not about, this is about boosting environmental performance, cleaning up the environment, preserving the environment, getting cleaner infrastructure built. So we do not roll back standards. We're just trying to cut some red tape in getting there. Uh, second, again, there are plenty of precedents and other things that we care about as a society where we've taken initiatives like the ones we describe in this report. So for example, in the Obama administration, there was a wonderful effort essentially to pre-zone some federal lands that would be appropriate for larger scale renewable energy development. That's what we're talking about here in some of these categories. Get that review done up front so projects can uh, be approved quickly and move and be built and start helping us cut that carbon. Um, in federal and state law, there are numerous categories of projects that have positive environmental impact where this kind of uh, pre-clearance is built in. So uh, hearkening to my days when I was Secretary of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, with projects like that, that were of net environmental benefit, um, those projects could be recognized under uh, more efficient permitting processes called general permits or permits by rule. So again, another kind of precedent where we have done this before, where we think things are important. And finally, as it relates to limiting the time and the scope of review, well, for goodness sakes, in federal procurement, we very, very tightly narrow what can be reviewed and under what time frame. Um, similarly, when there's foreign investment into US companies, those reviews happen in expedited fashion in the matter of months instead of in a matter of year, years. So putting it all together, the, the precedents are there, the urgency is here, 
And now it's the time to act, to fix this one significant hurdle we have, frankly, to get out of our own way so that decarbonization can move forward so that we can cut greenhouse gas emissions and so that we will be able to achieve the objectives of Paris, of so many businesses, of so many countries now aligned. Let's get to work, let's get it done, and let's realize a clean energy future. Greg, back to you, and thanks for the chance to share this neat piece of work that the whole team put together. Excellent, thank you, Katie. We really appreciate your dedication to this topic and, and to this work. I um, want to make sure that we, uh, everyone sees we put the link to the final report in the chat, and so you can um, access it there. I'm now pleased to introduce Congressman Paul Tonko. Um, Congressman Tonko is a seven-term member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing New York's 20th Congressional District. He's a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and chaired the Environment and Climate Change Subcommittee since 2013. Welcome, Congressman. Uh, thank you, Greg, and thank you for the work along with Aspen Institute for convening such an expert group and producing this report. And a great summary offered there, Katie. And I do a special thank, out, a thank you shout out to Katie and Jim for facilitating in grand fashion the discussions that led to this report. They did a super job. If you are interested in this report, you probably already agree that climate change is a societal and economic threat, and we must urgently reduce emissions. I come to this challenge as someone who believes we need urgent and ambitious action, but I also know we cannot wave a wand to stop climate pollution. We're going to need to build things, renewable generation, modernized grid infrastructure, um, EV charging, for instance. All of those projects are going to require permits and other reviews. And that will inevitably be in tension with the speed at which we want to achieve ambitious emission reduction goals. So I am very glad that this report can help focus this conversation because as we move through the 2020s, we will find regulatory barriers are just as great, if not greater than technological or cost barriers. In recent years, the debate about just how to best achieve our climate goals has not evolved uniformly. Today, there is a growing consensus around emissions targets and a recognition of the need for some sort of national carbon management program, a clean electricity standard, a carbon price, or some other national regulatory framework. But even if we were to enact a policy, such as say the CES proposed by President Biden, there are still major hurdles in the way to achieving the goals of such a policy and building the necessary infrastructure to make that standard achievable has been detached from the overall energy transition debate. So I believe it is critical that we consider these challenges in the context of generation targets. And I am pleased that there is a growing recognition of these challenges. FERC is examining barriers and incentives to transmission. And there's President Biden calling for a transmission investment tax credit and a DOE grid deployment authority as part of his AJP. And more members of Congress have been engaged on what has traditionally been seen as a thorny political issue. This is largely because the chorus of experts that have told us if we want to achieve ambitious clean energy targets, we need to deploy a lot of zero emission resources very quickly. According to recent studies, we may need about 70 new gigawatts of clean electricity added to our energy mix each and every year for the next 15 years. Last year, we deployed less than one half of that. So nearly all of these projects will require extensive siting and extensive permitting processes. To achieve our goals, we may need to triple the size of the electric transmission grid. Every credible study suggests there is a significant need to build new interstate transmission lines to enable geographically constrained renewables to be built and for that electricity to be used where it is needed. But we are talking about a decarbonized grid by 2035 or an 80% clean grid by 2030. And today, it often takes 10 years to build a new interstate transmission line. 
So it is hard to see how we can reconcile these goals, but I'm glad this is something the report is trying to shine a light on and it's doing a great job. For our part in Congress, the House Energy and Commerce Committee has proposed several ideas to address this looming challenge. We have suggested FERC establish a clear interregional transmission planning process. We have proposed addressing federal backstop authority on permitting for a narrow set of transmission projects where one state blocks a line that would obviously benefit multiple states. And we are thinking through ways to allocate project costs more broadly amongst all of its beneficiaries. I have also worked on a bill that would incentivize local governments to adopt model permitting protocols for distributed generation, like rooftop solar. I do not want to suggest these proposals are sufficient, and the report makes several other great recommendations for policymakers and stakeholders to consider. So grateful for the report. But this is a complicated issue, and it is going to take engagement with state and local governments and community groups to find workable solutions. The people that acknowledge the need for urgent climate action are also generally supportive of robust environmental review and community engagement around infrastructure projects. I too want to build clean energy very quickly while also, while also maximizing public participation, uh, environmental justice and uh, landowners' rights. So how do we create a permitting and siting system that enables achievement of our clean energy goals while not undermining our environmental justice goals? This will not be easy, but it is a problem worth wrestling with. And I don't know if we have all the right answers, but the people that worked on this report are asking the right questions. And as long as we see geographically constrained resources as amongst the most cost-effective zero emission electricity options for the future, these are necessary conversations to have. So congratulations to one and all who contributed to this report. Thank you again to the leadership of Katie and Jim. And I hope we can work together to elevate this as part of the broader national clean energy debate. And I look forward to today's discussion. It will be interesting to hear what all have to say. So thank you again for the report. It proves most useful. Thank you, Congressman Tonko. We really appreciate that. And um, especially about the point at the end about uh, stakeholder engagement. I think that's a really important um, uh, uh, point to be made here. Um, Thank you, Greg. I'm also excited to introduce uh, Congressman Sean Kasten. Unfortunately, he had a conflict today, but was able to record a short video about the report. Um, as a scientist and clean energy entrepreneur and CEO, and now as a member of Congress representing the western suburbs of Chicago, Congressman Kasten has dedicated his life to fighting climate change. Um, he serves on the, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, as well as the Select Committee on the uh, Climate Crisis. So let's hear from Congressman Kasten now. Hello all, Congressman Sean Kasten here. I'm sorry I can't join you in person today, but really want to commend you for uh, um, all the folks at Aspen Institute, Bipartisan Policy Center, everybody who's participated in really putting out a necessary, great, thoughtful um, well-researched report. I would expect nothing less if you've given all the talent that's, uh, that's in the room here. Um, I also think it's really, really timely and urgent. We are, we're in this moment right now in the thick of infrastructure talks with the White House, um, trying to figure out how to get this done. We've, of course, recently seen um, some of the efforts at bipartisan talks break down. And, and let's be honest, they've broken down in part over climate. Um, we have not found a way to make sure that we prioritize climate and to make sure that we get bipartisan consensus. And that's unfortunate, but as, uh, as that great philosopher uh, from The Clash said, although I think they ripped it off somebody else, when you fight the laws of physics, the laws win. And we need to make sure that we continue to give the Biden administration um, any backbone they need to say, we cannot fight the laws of physics. They will win and we gotta get out in front of this. So, so thank you for the timeliness and let's make sure that we keep uh, prioritizing. Um, the, um, I, I also think the report does a really nice job of upping our ambition. 
we, we of course have constraints and a lot of times the debate across the aisle is about how to allocate scarce resources. We have finite amounts of money. We have finite amounts of time. We have finite amounts of labor. How we prioritize those matters and that's a healthy debate, but we should never be constrained by ambition. And you know, pointing out that we electrified rural America in 15 years is really, really important because sometimes we just have to set our sights a little higher. And that's what gets us through. So, so thanks for doing that. A couple of things in this report I really, really, really like. As, as you all know, I've been pushing almost ever since I got into Congress for direct pay. Um, it's, it's crazy that we, we give tax credits to people who are, by virtue of doing the right thing, are sitting on depreciation shields and interest shields, and then they've got to go do all these complicated tax equity structures if they want to monetize. Direct pay is huge. It will open up a ton of capital. Thank you for emphasizing it. Um, I, I also really, really like your push to direct FERC to factor greenhouse gas factors into their transmission siting. It's a part of the, the interregional transmission planning bill that I've introduced with Senator Heinrich. It also, I would submit to you, is, is, is effectively an obligation of FERC that's created by the, uh, the 1935 Federal Power Act coupled with the endangerment finding from Massachusetts versus EPA. They, they have to do this. Um, I think the uh, I think certainly Chairman Glick I think agrees with that. Um, pushing them, reminding them is always a good thing. And and that related to that, I love the idea of pre-zoning. Um, I don't need to, the the obvious policy reasons you all you all know well, but much like the pushing on FERC, if we are for some unfortunate reason unable to find a way legislatively to prioritize the laws of physics um, in the name of bipartisanship. Pre-zoning can be done largely unilaterally by the relevant agencies, as can FERC decisions. And I think making sure that we, we continue to remind, remind the Biden White House and, and the, the heads of those agencies that they have the, the legal obligation to act, the moral obligation to act, and and the authority to move, even if if we have some legislative hiccups, I hope we don't. But but let's make sure that we use every arrow and uh, whatever quiver we end up uh, we end up having. Um, the one area that I do just want to keep in mind a little bit as you think about you know what you do next with this report is to keep in mind that when we talk about environmental justice, there are there are two separate communities we have to talk about, and they both are equally important. There's the one group that uh, that I think you, you talk about at some length in the report, which is those groups of people who were disadvantaged by our historic dirty energy system, primarily people of color, primarily folks in lower income areas, people who live downwind of the smokestacks and the effluent pipes most generally, have to look out for them. Thank you for doing it. The second group, so if the first group is the folks who were disadvantaged by the historic system, the second group are the group who's going to be disadvantaged by the transition to the new system. The transition to clean energy is a huge wealth transfer from energy producers to energy consumers. That's awesome. It's going to create a ton of wealth. We're going to lower the cost of energy and we're going to make energy cleaner. It's also really, really both politically and ethically hard. What do we, what do we say to somebody who's made a good living and had a good life working in Appalachia in you know, extractive industries or processing fossil fuel? Um, some of those people can be retrained. Some of those people can move. Not all of them can. And I would submit to you that if we can figure out how to make sure to, to address the needs of that group as well, the folks who are displaced, I think we probably address a lot of the underlying political tensions that make it so hard to overlap what's physically necessary with what is bipartisanly possible. Because if you look at a map of the country, that wealth transfer from energy producing areas, which are land heavy, to energy consuming areas that are people heavy, looks an awful lot like a red blue map of the United States. And it's completely understandable by, by why you know elected members who represent those energy intensive but people less intensive parts of the country um, are going to have some reluctance to say am i really representing um, you know my district if if i encourage this transition to clean energy so that second piece of ej is really important to making sure that that's possible and, and i know you guys will do a great job of it but just want to make sure we don't lose sight of it so thank you again fantastic report and uh and now let's make sure that we uh we don't just leave it dusty on the shelf. We move on to implementation. Um, thanks again. Be well, everybody.
Excellent. We thank uh, Congressman Kasten for for joining us and and um, going through the report uh, uh, with us. So now um, I'm pleased to introduce Jason Grumet to lead a panel conversation on the report uh, and its implications. Jason is the president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, which he founded in 2007 with former U.S. Senate Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. And over the last decade, BPC has combined the best ideas from both parties to promote health security and opportunity for all Americans. Um, under Jason's leadership, BPC's harnessed the power of collaboration and evidence to advocate for a broad array, uh, array of politically viable policy solutions. So I wanna turn it over to Jason now to introduce the panelists and to uh, lead our discussion. Jason. Well, thank you, Greg, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I have a lot of favorite topics, but this might be my favoritest of the favorite topics. I think the um, last several speakers really framed the discussion correctly. To the extent that we truly want to solve the climate challenge, we have an incredible logistical scale issue to address. We clearly will decarbonize the economy. The question is, will we do it in the next 25 to 35 years? I have said too often with no data that I think we are on a path to achieve net zero emissions by about 2087, if we allow the natural technological and democratic processes to play out. And I think everyone in this discussion recognizes that that is not uh, an acceptable outcome. So there's really two things that um, get me revved up about this conversation. And I think the excellent work that, uh, that Aspen has done to put these issues forward. So I think the first is that um, the politics and the ecology of this challenge align. We have a fundamental obligation to move things faster. I think that has been something that has been clear to those who focus on the imperative of the climate challenge for a number of years. And we also have a real political imperative to build things faster, to recover that great capacity to electrify the nation in 15 years, to you know, build massive dams in 36 months, to have the capacity to move out of this pandemic economy with vibrancy and I think kind of affirmative vigor. Um, we also, and I think Congressman Kasten was addressing this, have a real obligation to disadvantaged communities to make them better and make them better faster. And I think that one of the aspects of this conversation that I know we're gonna talk about in a few minutes uh, is the question around equity and environmental justice, both for the you know, existing energy intensive uh, parts of the country and the places that have been suffering from aspects of our energy intensive society. I think the, the second part of the conversation that uh, I find very appealing is the alliteration. So I am, uh, I am delighted by the uh, affirmative adjective alliteration, the Aspen Building Cleaner Faster Project. Um, the Bipartisan Policy Center has our own parallel initiative we'll talk about a little bit, which is the Smarter Cleaner Faster Project. But the, the grand pappy of all affirmative adjective alliteration was a Senate hearing last July 1st, which was the Better, Faster, Cheaper, Smarter, Stronger Infrastructure Project. And so I think we all have capture the sense that there is a moment to weaponize speed in the service of ecological achievement. And for this conversation today, we have three really um, great speakers. I will do some quick introductions and then we'll get rolling. You have heard him referenced already. Uh, his reputation always does precede him, Jim Connaughton. Jim uh, was a key author of this study. He is the president and CEO of Nautilus, Nautilus Data Technologies, which he will explain a little bit, but it's bringing a little bit of the smarter side of uh, infrastructure data to the equation. Jim was formerly executive vice president at uh, Exelon and Constellation Energy, the, I believe, largest uh, zero carbon producer of electric power in the country. And of course, he was uh, chairman of the White House Council of Environmental Quality. We also have Emily Shapira, who is the president and CEO of the Philadelphia Energy Authority. Um, Emily, and she will ask her about this, has launched a billion dollar 10 year initiative to invest in clean energy and energy efficiency in a way that will also inspire and create at least 10,000 good paying jobs. So we're gonna look at the combination of those investments and those economic opportunities. She was also the director of global accounts for Wesco distribution and worked on sustainability at Intel and Verizon and was recognized last year as one of Philadelphia Business Journal's 40 under 40 honorees. So, um, Congratulations for being under 40, which is something that few of us on this call can remember even vaguely. Finally, uh, friend and colleague Colette Honorable. Colette is a partner at Reed Smith, where she works on a variety of clean energy transition challenges. Uh, she was chair of the Arkansas Public Utility Commission 
She was president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUC. We will be talking a lot about those pesky states here in a moment. And also, I think most know that she was a commissioner recently at uh, FERC in the Obama administration. Last, but certainly not least, she's also a senior fellow at the BPC and one of the co-chairs of our Smarter, Cleaner, Faster uh, Infrastructure Task Force. So what I'd like to do, we have a good 45, 50 minutes for this, is focus a little bit on politics, talk some about the institutional challenges at play. Um, I would argue that the Aspen study is both incredibly ambitious and woefully inadequate to the task. And so how do we square that circle? And then finally, um, definitely want to think through some of these questions around equity, environmental justice. And so let me get it started. Um, and let's just talk politics. I'm going to ask, uh, I think, each of the panelists to say a few words. But um, Jim Connaughton, I am positing that there is a unique alignment in the need for speed that has the capacity to solve the climate challenge and also change the politics. Um, agree, disagree, modify. 100% agree. And good to see everybody. 100% uh, agree. We are at one of those um, sort of cross-generational moments in time when we have a remarkable degree of alignment uh, that can help cut through uh, the, um, some of the dissonance, some of the you know, difficulties we have. And where's that alignment? The alignment actually starts with a broad national desire to upgrade all of our infrastructure. Okay, and that's broad. That's just ground up county by county, city by city to upgrade our infrastructure. We're way overdue across the board. And so there's a lot of political strength in that and the ability to vie for political favor in accomplishing that. Uh, we haven't had that kind of solid ground in, in more than a decade, probably two decades. Okay, so that's huge. Um, with that is the debate and dissonance over um, climate change, which is really driven by what we've heard um, what we've heard because it's all about well you can be so ambitious but never achieve it uh taking too long adds cost uh it's regulatory complex to do projects in environmental justice communities or in communities in transition so it ends up going to green fields so all the politics is skewed if we don't have speed on our side but if we have speed on our side um i can assure you on the republican side of the aisle this has been a clamoring point for decades uh, and on the Democratic side of the aisle, uh, it's, it's clamoring for speed with clean. Uh, you've got this tremendous opportunity for alignment. Now, let me just add money, just the money thing. Uh, there's all kinds of proposals, federal, state, and local on tax, on incentives. But the other money pieces with, especially during COVID, people are sitting on trillions of dollars of private capital. They actually want to spend it on this stuff. Okay, and so so this is a rare moment in time when we probably have more private sector dollars ready to go into large municipal projects, large private clean energy projects um, than we have ever seen in the history of America. Okay, C consolidated, ready to align with the, with the federal funding. They just want to be able to spend it. And the way it works is if I spend a dollar today and I can see it put into motion next year, I'm going to spend that dollar today. If I have the dollar today and I have to wait 5, 10, 15 years, I'm going to spend it on something else, something else that will move faster. So this is a matter of choice of capital, and the money will always go to the fastest project delivering the fastest outcome. Um, and then one final point of alignment uh, has to do with um, the communities. So environmental justice communities and communities for whom we have to provide an equitable transition want new opportunity. Okay, they actually don't want social welfare, they want new opportunity. As it turns out, those communities can be can transform from being the hosting brown infrastructure to becoming the host of the new green infrastructure. And that's really efficient too, because we already have the connections, the hookups, the worker skills. So this is a chance to go from environmental injustice to environmental opportunity um, in both of those sets of communities. And guess what? It's union jobs as far as the eye can see. We don't have enough union workers in America to pull this off right now. So we need to know it's going to happen so that we can put folks through the trainings, the schools all over the country, that we can plan that curriculum so that the projects become live within two or three or four years instead of within five or 10 or 20 years. And we actually have a workforce of highly skilled uh, folks, uh, family wage jobs, uh, with the stability and reliability of being able to um, find continuous work between now and 2050. Um, I just want to end 
we did rural electrification in 15 years, uh, completed it 15 years later. For heaven's sakes, the French built a zero emission electricity system in 30 years, you know, and the Chinese just last year, um, you know, actually over the last six years, the Chinese built the entire US energy system in six years. So we have to and can rise to that challenge. And I think that's where the common ground lies. All right, great uh, buoyant opening, talking about the positive disruption. Um, well, I'm gonna, can I ask you the same question with a little bit of a feed in? And that is that um, speed has not always been popular when it's come to building things, right? And think, at least my view is that for the last 15 years of not really having a federal, you know, clear policy around climate, you know, speed has been a proxy for just doubling down on old infrastructure. And there has been a sense that these siting debates have been the one moment where the environmental community, the climate advocacy community actually had a role and it was trying to slow things down. Do you think it is possible, generally, to shift that narrative towards a shared investment in speed if it is in the goal of decarbonization? Absolutely. And let me say, I'm delighted to be here with, of course, Jason and the BPC, and also my very, very dear friends at the Aspen Institute. This, both efforts have been, maybe I'm kind of the bridge between the two to use an interest. Always are. <laughs> but. Yes, I've witnessed, given my background, unbelievable delays in projects, unbelievable lack of coordination, unbelievable lack of communication, and uh, challenges with certainty around investment decisions. Yes, I think it's possible. And it's my history that draws me to this work so much. Like Jim, I'm equally positive about this moment in time to Katie's point, the stars are aligned. We are sitting right now in an unprecedented time in our nation's history where we are collectively focused on equity, on economics. And now then this thing that unifies every uh, politician, <laughs> Uh, every uh, participant in the energy space infrastructure. So yes, I do believe that where we are more surgical in, in where we're finding opportunities for efficiency, and this report puts forward a number of them. I was so pleased to hear Senator Congressman Tonko speaking about um, interregional planning. That was music to my heart. That was one of the main gravamens I had at FERC, this really troubled spot where we need the greatest amount of uh, development, the interregional process. The very thing that has made our nation so great, uh, respecting the diversity in regions and states has now proven to be one of our greatest challenges. And so interregional planning is definitely a place where in order to spur the clean energy transition and also to spur greater investment, greater certainty around investment, uh, greater opportunities for return. Um, this, is a, this is about economics, but we can put them together and focus on how we support the clean energy transition as well. Very pleased to hear Congressman Kasten speaking about EJ issues so eloquently. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. So we are enlightened and there's an old saying in the South, when you know better, you do better. We know we haven't done right by all communities uh, throughout the history of our energy production. Heck, when Jim put it the way he did, and we've got a lot of work to do in terms of what folks are doing around the globe. But we know that in the midst of this transition, we can be thoughtful. We can focus on uh, Biden's plan to shift this 40% of benefits to ensure that everyone benefits. So I think there's a, a unique opportunity for us here to focus on doing it better, faster, cleaner, and in an equitable way as well. I have to admit, I did have to Google and make sure those were adjectives. I'm, I've not been very helpful to my children in their uh, sentence diagramming this year. Um, Emily, so let's get you into this discussion. And you know, we're gonna talk a lot about institutions, but from a local leader perspective, you know, a lot of the issue has been we have these broad national ambitions, but you, know, you got to build stuff where people live. And that's often where, you know, we wind up having those challenges. So how does Philadelphia, the nation state of Philadelphia, think about um, these opportunities? I, I won't turn down that label. Um, 
you know, I, we've had a really interesting experience with this over the last few years. So I'll, I'll set sort of a bit of context first. Um, I run the Philadelphia Energy Authority, which is a municipal government entity really focused on building a clean uh, energy economy here in Philly that is both robust and equitable. Um, we have uh, one of the highest energy burdens across our population of anywhere in the country. Uh, we have really rampant energy insecurity. Over half of all African-American households at any income level in Philadelphia face energy insecurity at least once a year. So uh, these are, these are uh, big issues for us and it presents both um, challenges and opportunities. Um, so a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, three, I would say, uh, we um, signed a contract for a 70 megawatt power purchase agreement um, for the city to support 22% of our city's electricity. That project has yet to be constructed. Um, you know, it's been an incredible challenge, both on the side of being a big off taker um, to really understand and build that, that expertise within our city government. Um, but then to really see what the risks are in the market and that uncertainty and sort of how this process goes um, has been really enlightening for us to see. And, and, and this report, I think, really touches on all of the challenges that we faced along the way uh, and would do a lot to sort of solve that. We've made a commitment to get to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Uh, and knowing how long it's taken to sort of get through the procurement and the permitting and uh, getting to actual construction and creating those opportunities for contractors and individuals who have gone through our training programs, um, you know, we're, we're running out of time to get to that, uh, that number. So I'm, I'm really appreciating deeply the, the work of this report um, since, since I think that would have real impacts on the ground for us in Philly. Um, I'll also mention, you know, we um, until about a year and a half ago had the largest oil refinery on the East Coast uh, located right in the city. Uh, there was an explosion and it had to close down and presented uh, huge risks to the surrounding community. Um, and in Philadelphia, I think we're sort of, unfortunately, the poster child for uh, environmental justice. Uh, over uh, decades and generations, we faced persistent poverty. Unfortunately, we've been, uh, have the, the moniker of the largest, the poorest big city in America. Um, and so, you know, we've really used the opportunity of our refinery closing down to say, how can we sort of reimagine uh, what energy looks like uh, in our city. We have training programs that target uh, the population that has been really um, historically underserved and who suffered from uh, many of the health problems that result from fossil fuel reliance. So uh, we're, we're excited to see where this report goes and, and I think we're, we're hitting on the right things and, and speed is, is the magic answer here, honestly. You know, if we can't get these projects done by 2030, there, there's no way to, to hit those goals. All right, that's a great, opening. I want to now focus a little bit on the kind of institutional questions. Um, you know, we in some ways have Jim, you can, we can make you the federal guy and Colette, you have some fond memories of Arkansas. So we have a little bit of a federal state local question that I'd like to focus on. I mean, just to, just to lead it off. And I think, you know, Congressman Tonko, I thought said this well, I mean, I think he basically said the challenges of innovation and democracy are as great or greater as the challenges with innovation and technology, which I don't think the country has really thought about enough. So, you know, my sense is that um, when it comes to permitting, the easy stuff is hard and the hard stuff is too scary to talk about in public. And since, you know, you guys have all had, you know, careers and have really no aspirations for the future, I want to talk about both. I want to talk about the easy hard stuff and the scary hard stuff. And so maybe just go federal, state, and local gym, like at the federal level, just within the existing system, before we knock over any apple carts, what are two or three things that should just be not that hard against the ambition of saving the world? What, what are some improvements at the federal level that you would think we should be able to metabolize without too much political angst? So I, I wanna use an analogy to enter into this question, which is when we had this topic about permit streamlining or permit reform, uh, Katie mentioned everybody falls back to that this is about rollbacks. Okay, and actually not at all, but I wanna use the analogy. Um, when we started this whole environmental thing 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have standards. We didn't have good standards at the federal level. We didn't have good standards at the state level and certainly not real active standards at the local level, even though that's where most of the activity was occurring. But over the last 50 years, we have built up the most incredible environmentally protective, natural resource protective set of laws in the world, unrivaled in the world. Uh, incredibly complex, 
but lots of now clearly defined standards um, by which any entity seeking to comply is subject to daily civil penalties of $25,000 a day per incident, and you could go to jail. Okay, so this is this is astounding, and where we've come in my lifetime in terms of compliance, um, it's rare that you have non-compliance now. I mean, this is what's amazing, and then the monitoring enforcement is unrivaled. And so, if you think about it, we have this huge body of very complex law, but everybody in the, especially in the energy and infrastructure space, knows it, and knows what they have to do to comply. And guess what? They have to comply, 100% of the time, while they're building the project and while they're running the project. And so if you think about what permitting is today, permitting is simply going to the regulators to say, I intend to comply and here's how, would you please give me permission to comply with the law? Okay, so we come to this new place because, and so it's odd, it's as if you have to wake up every morning and say, I intend to drive the speed limit today, but you have to go to all the local you know, police stations and all the local communities and let them know in advance that you're intending to get in your car today and drive under the speed limit. Okay, and so we've created this weird animal for ourselves where we can actually achieve a lot of quite technically um, specific um, uh, assurance of compliance with super aggressive enforcement on the back end. And yet we have to go through this three, five, 10, 15 year process to get permission to comply with the law. We have to overcome that. It's that level of complexity. So how do we get to, um, um, you know, how do we get to more of a mode where you can declare your intended compliance and be actually accountable for it, um, but, have, but have the appropriate oversight. You need the oversight, but how can we get there? As it turns out, technology is our friend. Um, more uh, standards are our friend, okay? And then in particular, categories of activity that we already know will comply. This is not like we're starting from scratch every time we do a new solar project. There are thousands of them. This is not starting from scratch every time we do a new transmission pro project. There are hundreds of them. Um, so we actually already know the character of these projects. We just need the legislators, the publicly accountable people to say, you know what? This kind of project in this kind of a situation uh, can go forward. You gotta comply with all the laws, but please go forward, okay? That's what it takes. That's the hard part actually. And I just want to say the bureaucracies will not achieve this. Every president since Jimmy Carter, including the one I worked for, has had a, a permit streamlining initiative. They've all been, you know, uh, pennies and half pennies, not dollars and thousand dollars worth of worth of uh, attainment. So they've all made little tiny progress. Nothing's lasted. Uh, it's been for dozens or maybe hundreds of projects, not the tens of thousands that we need. So there's a scale issue here that only legislation can solve at the federal level. And then a lot of these federal laws are implemented at the state and local level, they're delegated. And so you have to condition the federal view screen uh, down through the states to the localities. Um, that is, you know, it's actually the things you have to do legislatively are simple. If you try to do them uh, through the administrative state, don't, rely on it at all. We've already proven that that will not work. So don't fall back to that. Uh, you, it's got to be legislated. I, I will call that regrets of a former CEQ uh, leader. Um, so Colette, let me ask you to um, add to that, but also, you know, there are a lot of folks who say, look, you know, you folks are all exaggerating the problem, right? Like things basically are getting built. And the argument is we don't need whole scale reform. What we really need is just to provide the resources for the process and let the process play out. Give us a little bit of the, on one hand, on the other hand. I mean, having spent some time approving some really big projects and just speaking from, you know, FERC isn't the entire permitting issue, but you know, where have you seen successes? Where are there places where you think we can build upon the existing structure? And then we can talk about the hard challenge of doing this 10 times faster than we've done before. Well, thanks, Jason. Let me build upon what Jim said. Jim, I'm pleased to hear you say standards are good because I wouldn't want anyone to take your comments to be that, you know, that work is not important. It's critically important. And what you are saying would aid in ensuring that those standards are met. And so let me go start from the back end, Jason. I'm normally a glass half full person, as you know. Let me be glass half empty, but from experience. From experience in Arkansas, um, 
we were very challenged with um, consideration of interstate um, transmission lines. High you were one of those pass-through states, right? That's right. We were one of the pass-throughs and we wanted some of that wind, to be clear. So this wasn't a, um, we're opposed to clean energy. So now in speaking up, Jim, I'm going to speak up myself here. We would have loved to get that wind. We were very supportive of making the transition and goodness knows in Arkansas, we needed more renewables uh, in our um, energy mix. This line would pass through the state and there was no intention to serve the Arkansas public. So then the Arkansas Public Service Commission is a creature of the state legislature. That's why Jim's point about the federal government stating what the law is and stating how the states will enact it is a critical point. Because no matter what I thought about wind, I was bound by uh, what certificates of authority could be granted to a facility in Arkansas that would wanna be a public utility. So we looked like kind of like the, the Grinch in that instance. And I recognized that it caused a great amount of concern in other states as well. Let me also give a glass half empty challenge, if you will, particularly now I'm going to my time at FERC. With energy projects, multi-billion dollar projects, which go through years of planning, years of going through the FERC certification process. Then they have to go back to Jim's point. Now they've got to go back to these states and clear those hurdles. And guess what? Sometimes they don't clear them. So you have billions of dollars uh, in overruns due to delays, uh, uncertainty, a lack of clear pathway forward for resources we know we need. And so we have to absolutely find a better way to do it. Jim's point is an excellent one. I would say one of the greatest challenges for me at FERC was working to integrate state policy into um, FERC jurisdictional wholesale, if you will, planning processes, uh, transmission planning and cost allocation, wholesale market operations. We need a lot of time spent there. So the first thing, the first stop to Jim's point, federal legislation. The second point, alleviating these very strident federal and state um, engagements because we have to sort out uh, how to not allow uh, federal roles and state roles to impede this very necessary progress that must be made in order for us to achieve uh, energy's goal, or Emily's goal of uh, getting more clean energy on the grid. Thank you, Clint. So I have to acknowledge that uh, since we started talking about Arkansas, Michael Skelly has texted me like 11 times uh, with fascinating insights. And I will just note that we do have a, a Q&A function. Yes. That, uh, I encourage people to uh, post questions and we'll start to integrate those as, uh, as we go. Yes, so, I got well acquainted with Michael doing that. I can imagine- if we could Four hours for that conversation. It would be very exciting. Um, Jason, picking up, yeah. picking up on Colin's point, can I just give a few facts just so people can get, put this in context? Um, and then we'll, Emily, just for a sec, quick second. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab finally did a study, okay, on what Colette was just talking about, and, and Emily's the, the problem she identified. So over the last 20 years, only 20% of the projects that want to connect to the grid, of 24%, ever made it to commercial operation. So in 20 years, we left 75% of clean energy projects, left them by the, by the wayside, right? We'd, we'd be done by now. Um, the time spent in the queue, and this is why, the time spent in the queue between 2010 and 2020, according to the Berkeley Lab, um, it took, I'm sorry, between 2000 and 2009, it took 1.9 years just to get to a decision, okay? Then you still have to build it. And during that period, you're losing, um, you're losing 75% uh, of your projects. Now, between 2010 and 2020, it takes 3.5 years, All right? That's just and to get- Jim, I a saw a line that, that took 10 years. 10 years, a transmission line in the West. Yeah. California, eight years now. And then finally, there's 755 gigawatts of new generation and 200 gigawatts of storage that are just stuck in the queue. Okay, by the way, we'd be done. 
If we just get those projects through, we'd be done. Um, that's, how, that's how big this is. $400 billion of renewable energy projects alone, 6,000 miles of transmission projects alone. So I just wanna, um, just wanna give you this flavor, and that's before we talk about carbon capture and storage, the need to uh, convert um, you know, uh, dams on small rivers and actually get energy from them, right? There's, there's all these little opportunities that can be done hundreds of times over, um, and even small modular nuclear, if you put them in existing nuclear sites, why should it take you 15 years to get that permitted? The sites are already protected. You know, so I just wanna highlight the scale of this before you go to Emily, because Emily will give us more on what's happening on the ground. All right, so Emily, in addition to answering all those questions, I wanna burden you with the um, national framework we call federalism. Because I think we all agree that no one wants to roll back any standards, but we're gonna to have to roll back some deciders. Right, if the federal government and the state government and sometimes multiple state governments and then the local governments all with a sincere desire to make the world a better place want to put their thumbprint on the decision, it seems like we're going to be still swirling in this mess. As a local leader, how do you feel about preemption? So generally, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about preemption broadly for a second. Generally, any uh, attempt at preemption of what the city decides, we fight it. Uh, this happened recently. A good example is the um, our legislature in Harrisburg um, uh, passed a bill to preempt cities from passing plastic bag bans. Um, you know they've tried to do the same for natural gas restrictions um, and and other things. And so those are things we we usually fight. So in you know to think about it in that context, and then to sort of come back to what our experience is in developing clean energy. Um, these are these are tough questions. So, and it, this just happened. There was an article in the uh, paper last week that um, a small municipality in central Pennsylvania um, essentially voted down a permit for a 75 megawatt array um, that would have been using sort of roadway roadside easement uh, rather than agricultural land, which was already essentially pre-zoned for for clean energy. And you know, it's a five-person panel and one of those people had a lease with the solar company already and so he had to recuse himself uh, and the vote was two to two and so the <laughs> was voted down. I mean these are um, based on really sort of um, individual decisions and it, it just makes no sense for a project that has been you know in development for all these years and, and will provide the benefits that it does. And so um, you know I think we're seeing the partisanship happen a bit um, at, or more than a bit at the local level, you know, I think it's, we're just as um, mired, I think, as the federal level is. And so um, whether or not we can achieve that sort of level of preemption, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I think this is one of those things where we've tried to follow federal best practices where we can, you know, we use the um, Soul Smart guidelines for permitting for solar in Philadelphia. Um, and we're sort of always looking for that guidance. I think we're really lucky to be a big city with, with a little bit of resources. So we can actually you know, figure out how to train our inspectors and, and um, plans examiners on how to understand these things. But you know, imagine that you're in a smaller municipality and, and you've got folks that have never had to come across this before and uncertainty and confusion and frustration and um, you know, I think even hearing from folks in, in rural Pennsylvania, we're hearing like the character of the land feels like it's changing and that's scary and maybe that's enough for us to oppose this. So um, clear, it, there's, too, there's too many issues, I think, to stake, uh, there's too many issues at the local level, I think, to stake our sort of global future on what a few people in, in you know, each town would make a decision on. So I, 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 though it's hard for us to sort of say, preemption is a good thing. I think in this case, when there's these sort of society level um, impacts at stake, you know, I think we're on board. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. And, you know, let's put it in a more positive frame, which I think is the way the study appropriately thought about it, which is that we have to move beyond 100,000 small decisions in the service of a shared national ambition. And if we actually were able to, as a nation, decide that we were moving forward to make a generational investment in clean energy under this infrastructure package. And I will note that I, I fear that once a decade, we have a chance to do something for, on climate and we tend to squander it. And I'm, I'm worried we're looking at that moment again, but let's assume that we are able to make a bipartisan commitment to a 200 to $300 billion clean energy investment as a nation. I wonder if anybody can talk a little bit about what would be an affirmative way 
to bring local communities in up front so that they're not ultimately either stuck feeling left out, which leads towards opposition, or you know, actually not able to provide their insights to the process. And I lean now this towards the question around EJ, because I think it's something we've all recognized is the outcomes have been problematic, but so is the process. And I think it's fair to say that we have a system which is both overburdensome and underprotective, which argues that there could be a better way. But Jim, you talked a little bit about kind of the pre-approval, Clay talked about kind of regional planning. Is there a, just a different kind of framework than just project by project decisions that would enable more of a shared success? Yeah, let me give you my, my huge most recent uh, example, which is called out in the report on a bipartisan basis. I call it the raise your hand approach. Communities, raise your hand. That's what I call it. Um, on a bipartisan basis led by Cory Booker and Tim Scott in the Senate, um, by, uh, this legislation passed for opportunity zones, okay, where governors work with local communities. Those communities raise their hand and say, I want to be an opportunity zone to bring in private sector investment. And the investors get to um, basically delay paying their taxes. And if they invest for the long term, five to 10 years, then their taxes are waived because they put so much money into the community. This is huge, okay? This, this could produce trillions of dollars of investment. Now, here's the beauty of the approach. The communities raised their hand. They said, we wanna be considered for this. Now, it's been recently criticized because the only thing built in the last couple of years as the rules were finalized have been like apartment buildings, okay? And it's been done by real estate developers. Well, why is that? Because you can't, because of the, this conversation we're having, you can't get big, you know, the massive job producing projects built because you can't get them permitted, especially in these communities because their environmental situation is so complex, okay? Whether it's in the urban core or it's out in the rural areas, it's, these are complex areas to redevelop, they're brownfields. But if we had a clean energy and infrastructure redesignation, so what happened is they're by census tracts. And so the census tracts tend to follow where people live, not where they work. Okay, and I could see the census tracts in Philadelphia, for example, a line. And so you have all these opportunity zones where people are living when they really want the investment in the place next door where they want to work. So if we just did a new round of designations and let the governors lead it, working with their local community leaders and said, okay, opportunity zone communities, nominate the old brownfield next door for a new designation, I could assure you tens and hundreds of millions of dollars would flow into those locations and turn them from brown to green. Okay, um, if, if you know, it, it would be, it's so exciting and it's so big and it's, it's a hands up, it's a raise your hand up. If you don't want the investment, if you don't want people touching your urban infrastructure and, and, and modernizing it, put your hand down. But if you put your hand up, say, and I put my hand up and I want automatic permitting because I want the dollars to flow tomorrow, not 10 years from now. So Clay, you, know, you and I have talked about the challenges around EJ. And I think the shared sense that it's been pretty rational for these communities to say, slow stuff down, because most of the things they've experienced, they have felt have been negative. We are at this inflection point, you know, locking in the status quo is not good for a disadvantaged community. And so I think to the credit of the Biden administration, they at least put forward this vision that, you know, 40% of the good stuff was going to go to disadvantaged communities. And I think we all know that that number 40% was because someone said a third and someone said a half and 40% seemed about right, right? This is, a, this is a symbolic, I'd say, commitment at this point more than a specific commitment. But how do you think that changes or could change the dynamic in this discussion, I think kind of consistent with what Jim was suggesting? I think it changes it incredibly. And let me go further to what Jim said. When you asked the question originally, Jason, I thought these communities wanna know what's in it for them. So, you know, in my, example of we wanted some of that win. We even finally talked Lauren Azar and the Secretary of the Department of Energy into some sort of off-ramp, um, but it never went anywhere, um, obviously, and uh, we did not approve the project, to be clear, but these communities want to know what's in it for them, and if you look at, and historically we know, EJ issues go back, heck, to the 1960s, to the Memphis sanitation worker um, issues around which civil rights really became so strong. And also in the 1980s, I'm recalling an incident, I believe in North Carolina where a chemical company 
uh, disperse a lot of soil that was contaminated in a rural uh, community. And so these communities feel put upon and have been, quite frankly, for years. To Emily's point about the health disparities, the socioeconomic disparities, and who's getting these jobs? They aren't getting them. Folks drive their trucks in all through their towns and roads, get that good money and take it back wherever they live. And so we need to be honest about how we've carried out this work. We haven't done it well in terms of being thoughtful, in terms of embracing the communities where we serve. This, this is important work. It has to go on somewhere. But we need to be more thoughtful about it. Are we going to stick another facility where there are already five in a community that's already burdened with this infrastructure? Uh, we've not, this is why we're where we are today, I would suggest. So this is a little bit of hard talk for us. We will see this administration, we already see them, quite frankly, and not just uh, cabinet level agencies, but even entities like FERC, an independent regulator, using this carrot approach you've talked about, Jason, but also the stick, because we're seeing enforcement ramping up in unprecedented ways. And even at uh, EPA, we've recently seen the revocation of a permit for a refinery in St. Croix uh, due to EJ concerns. We've seen FERC very recently um, require an, uh, a compressor station to stop operating so that um, the commission could explore whether or not its continued operation was in the public interest. One of the considerations was EJ. So it's a new day. And whether you're encouraged by that or motivated by it, and quite frankly, whether you're scared by it, uh, this is, an, again, an unprecedented time where all of these uh, agencies throughout federal government, that's touching us locally. Uh, it really will compel us to do this work better. And I'm really glad about it. And so in my day-to-day -day work, I'm helping a lot of companies who are trying to get their heads around what is EJ? Um, how will it visit itself? How will these issues visit themselves upon me and how they can do this work better? Focusing on community benefits, committing to hire locally, committing to support local uh, foundations and institutions, et cetera. So there, we have a lot of opportunity. The wealth in this sector is in, insane, quite frankly. And we should be ashamed of ourselves that more of it isn't flowing to those communities in the first place. A great setup for the jobs conversation. And just to you know, add maybe two entry points. One is I think Jim did his best Norma Ray impersonation at the beginning, talking about the you know, labor jobs for everyone, which I think is an important point, both substantially and politically. I think it's also fair, at least from my perspective, we've oversold green jobs, right? We've wandered into you know, coal country and basically said, don't worry, everyone's gonna get a good green job. And it's just, it's not true, it's patronizing. I think there's been a kind of an ethos around the green jobs argument, which while well intended has been um, simplistic. So you're really doing it. You have you know, some resources, you have a population, you have projects. What works, right? What's an authentic green jobs agenda that can actually motivate both urban and rural communities? I like that question. Um, yeah, I, I think if there's one thing that both urban and rural communities want, it's jobs and it's quality of life. And I think if you can um, design things so that you're supporting both, you're a winner. So, um, and, and I think we, we all agree with that. And, and so the question becomes sort of, um, how do you get this done with insiders? And I, you know, I, I say that just, you know, Philly is a big city, but um, I, we, we talk about ourselves as kind of the smallest big city ever. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody has a feeling of, you know, you're from here, you're not. And, and I imagine other people feel that way too. So um, everything becomes localized then. So on our project, uh, which is still being uh, getting into construction, hopefully soon, um, but on our big 70 megawatt project, it's based in Adams County, Pennsylvania, which is about two and a half hours outside of Philadelphia near Gettysburg. Uh, in a community that has more or less nothing at all to do with Philadelphia. Um, so how, how can we design uh, those projects in a way that supports our local community and supports the communities where it's sited, 
Well, a couple of things. So one, we negotiated a, a prevailing wage that's somewhere in the middle between Adams County's prevailing wage and Philadelphia County's prevailing wage, um, which made a big difference. That allows both Adams County contractors to do well and make money, and it allows Philadelphia contractors to be able to compete for that work. Um, second, we created a workforce development agreement with the owner operator of the project um, that includes uh, a bunch of things. One is simply field trips for our, our high school solar trainees to get out there and see what it really looks like to build one of these projects. Um, and two is actual opportunities for our, um, adult trainees, young adult trainees, uh, to be on the ground working in the field on this project development for a certain number of weeks and then have opportunities to interview for full-time employment uh, with the contractors that are actually selected to build the project. And I think that's how we've designed all of our work, whether it's energy efficiency or renewable energy development, where um, at every time as a municipal government or, or as a technical advisor to corporate projects um, that, that we're building something, we're thinking what are the implications for job creation and who's gonna get those jobs? I think to Jim's point, um, you know, often these are union jobs all day long. Sometimes they're not. And sometimes I think for, um, you know, especially for uh, our population, so young black men in Philadelphia are unemployed at a rate that is two or sometimes three times higher than the unemployment rate in the rest of Philadelphia. And so if we're trying to change that systemic issue, um, then we need to focus on that population and find opportunities for them to get in. And so, um, so, so the way that we've done that is sometimes in partnership with the unions and other times that's not a possibility. And so we're, we're building other on-ramps. So, you know, I think while um, this requires big federal ideas and big, um, you know, uh, institutional level ideas, this also requires a lot of support for local entities that are going to be on the ground, connecting the populations who are most disadvantaged, both from EJ communities and from, um, uh, I think Congressman Kasten put it, uh, put it well, people who will be just disadvantaged by, uh, by the transition. So. I think it's sort of that that dual uh, approach that's needed. And, and frankly, there's not a lot of resources that come to the, the local level um, from the federal level or from anywhere else to support this type of work. And you know, it's exciting to see the Biden administration now announcing a new $30 million initiative for workforce training, uh, particularly around clean energy, but um, it's nowhere near enough funding to sort of have the scale and the impact that we need to fundamentally uh, change the systemic issues that have been in place for generations. So. I think that's a that's a component that needs to be attached. I'm going to pull a, a couple of questions from uh, the chat, and then I'm going to ask you all to speak to your members of Congress before we close this out. A, a question from our uh, friend and colleague Rich Powell at ClearPath. I will summarize. Rich is bringing up the question of how do we actually start to you know right size the impact of some of this nimbyism. He has picked the perfect example, which is people in the Hamptons who don't like underground power lines bringing offshore wind to Long Island, consistent with New York State's very bold goals around um, offshore wind. And so let me, um, let me ask the question in the specific example of offshore wind. People like windmills, they don't like power lines. Discuss. Colette, so the, Jim? Uh, so if we are about this effort together on resilient infrastructure and on, on transformation to cleaner, cleaner infrastructure and energy, um, we, all, we, we, ha we have to jointly share the hypocrisy meter, okay? You, know, you, you, you can't be for addressing the climate crisis and be against any emission reducing activity, any emission, you can't. So now, if, if you don't care about the climate crisis, I get that, but if that's what you care about, you can't be against it. So there has to be a, um, a, a collective transformation of our thinking on that. And it's not just, you talked about NIMBYism, Jason, um, it's also bananaism, okay, which is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything, okay. Um, so, and that's just as bad now, okay, because there's and, and so, um, and so that's why we have to have this filter. It's, it's been a proxy war over over dirty investment versus clean investment, which is why I turned the jobs point on its head. We're looking through the wrong end of the telescope uh, because we we want to define green jobs. That's like completely wrong. Every job that puts out new infrastructure, every job that puts out environmentally compliant energy, okay, every job that advances carbon abatement either through mand mandates or incentives is a green job. I'm sorry, you know, it is. And it's because we're replacing the old dirty stuff with newer, better stuff. And if we, if we create categories 
and narrow the view screen, if we say it's only 40% in these communities, why, is, why isn't it 80%? I don't know what the number is. The number should be 100%, right? I, I, I don't know why we're creating a category is we need to unleash the investment. And by the way, the investment is going to find these communities with their hands up saying, please come here and repurpose all of this great civil and all this great social infrastructure that we already have. I'm doing it myself with a project up in Maine right now at an old paper mill that shut down and put 10,000 people out of work. So the communities want it, they want to be connected, but um, it's a collective shift in consciousness. I hate to say it, it's a political will issue to say, we must be willing to overturn the hypocrites. Okay, and, and that's very hard if you, that's why you need a legislative process to do it. Uh, you have to have the political will, but every offshore wind project should be approved subject to its demonstrating it will be able to, you know, manage the, the you know, all of the resource requirements it has to manage, which they will all do because they'll know they'll go to jail if they don't. So we need, I, I really want to focus on this. It has to be self-implementing as much as humanly possible because if it's allocated through the political process or allocated in time through the political process, we're going to be right back where we were, you know, going at uh, one tenth the pace of China, which is nuts. And they're building deep, they're building dirty faster. We need to build cleaner faster. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left and you've mentioned the words political process a couple of times. And so let's just step back for a moment and talk about this next five or six weeks, which I think are consequential for the future of this debate. And if one wants to get emotional, the future of our climate challenge, um, you kind of see how this is setting up, right? We now have, uh, everyone agrees kind of about surface transportation and broadband, but this, this gang of 10 is not really talking about clean energy. You have the administration's plan. And if you look at the physical infrastructure part of the two and a half, $3 trillion plan, there's about a trillion dollars of physical energy, of which about three, four hundred billion is, is clean energy. We now have folks on the progressive side of the equation essentially saying they don't want to have any bipartisan infrastructure discussion unless presumably it includes some clean energy standard mandate or a big carbon tax. So here we go again, right? We have a moment where there seems like there could be significant national alignment around a big physical infrastructure investment, which could be inclusive of a lot of clean energy, or we could have the usual fight about all versus nothing, which traditionally results more close to nothing than to all. So here, you know, here's your moment. This is of course not a lobbying activity. This is a 501c3 Aspen Institute educational forum, but if members of Congress happens to tune in or the administration, if I could just go kind of Colette and Emily and then Jim, what would you ask our elected leaders to focus on if there was a moment for a bold, bold investment or bold, bold action on climate change in the next four to six weeks? Colette, what's your, what's your wish? List? I would say, thank you, streamlining permitting uh, processes. Um, that is a place where, where Congress can play a role, should play a role, they must play a role. And, and I would urge them to pick up this report or the BPC report and haul some of us in to talk about how they can get this done. Um, rather than, than they are working at this lowest common denominator you know, place, let's coalesce around where we agree. That's what these two organizations do so well. And I think focusing on, on the timelines for siting is a, a critical element that must be addressed. So can I interpret, Colette, that the argument over the statute of limitations on citizen suits in FAST 41 does not strike you as a bold enough response for the moment? We've got to figure out how to cut down the timeline here. So Jim was very passionate in setting forth the reasons why. I gave a few of my own examples. These things are real and we have to fix it. It doesn't matter how much money is going to flow if the process is through which the the projects are being considered is faulty or not efficient, not quick enough. So we've got to address that issue right away. Emily, not asking you to speak to any particular member, but what would you like the Congress to be thinking about in the next four to six weeks? Um, you know, I think the, um, the fifth point in this report is a helpful one. Um, if we can assign a fee in the same way that we do for, for rural broadband, or rural uh, electrification and, and other things, um, 
that that is distributed then to local communities. I think to Colette's point earlier, you know, what is it, what's in it for these communities? Um, I think that'll go a long way. And, and so I, I would urge them to include that one. Uh, that seems like a bit of a no brainer, honestly. Uh, and I, I think they should um, think bigger and more urgently as, as I always feel. <laughs> Um, and, and I hope this is the moment, I, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I think Jim's uh, point about 75% of the projects not getting done um, feels right and also uh, feels awful. And we're just wasting resources and time in the middle of an emergency. So I, I'd like to hear Congress talking about it that way. And um, I, I, I think there's a false dichotomy about where the value is in this country in clean energy. I think you know, rural communities um, often are really missing out on great opportunities. So I, I think sort of the answer to the previous question too, I think that's a bit how you fight the NIMBYism, really um, direct those benefits to, to everyone who gets involved and, and let's talk about it in terms of a benefit rather than as a, as a penalty or, or you know, some uh, change that people aren't gonna be able to stomach. So Jim, I know you're always reluctant to offer free advice, but just for me, what would you, uh... What would you want the Congress to do? Forget this conversation for the moment. Getting an agreement on the infrastructure bill that's in front of us through regular order on a bipartisan basis, doesn't matter what the deal is, doesn't matter how small or big you think it is, modeling good behavior of general agreement is the most important thing because the next step is harder, but it will be the more consequential one, which is a clean energy standard, sort of the big tax bill, and then, um, and then this, because it's gonna take some time to work this out, okay? But I can see the deal because we've had it before. Brownfields with small business liability relief in 2001, the Healthy Forest Act in 2003, the 2007 energy bill with the biggest carbon mandates in history with Jim Inhofe, climate change is a hoax and Barbara Boxer on the same bill, okay? Because they had, they had complementary reasons for supporting it, even though they fundamentally disagreed on, 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 on each other's rationale, okay? So, um, and then, so you have to model good behavior. I can't overemphasize how important regular order on authorizing legislation is, okay? This, this, this uh, idea of going through a reconciliation is a fool's choice. You have a one in 20 chance of success and it buys you 20 years of enmity, see Anwar. Okay, and so regular order is the coin of the realm. There's so much common ground if you don't have to force conversion on every point. There's so much common ground. And so I wanna go straight from this bill, you know, led by Joe Manchin and then right into the, the harder but more consequential stuff, which is a real carbon objective nationally set along with the, the streamlining mechanisms and the funding that will make people comfortable, it won't break the bank and will give us global leadership. In fact, we'll be exporting this stuff. Um, that's the great promise that we have. Well, Jim, I, on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center, I uh, thank you both for the substance and the process of that comment. I will uh, encourage folks to check out our From Sea to Shining Sea, $1 trillion regular order, let's get it done proposal. Um, I wanna thank uh, our panelists. I wanna thank Jim and Katie for the hard work of leading this effort. Um, Greg and Tim at Aspen have done a terrific job. I think really encouraging um, to have Congressman Tonko and Kasson provide so much input to this process, but also I think their framing of these issues is really quite compelling. And uh, I would just acknowledge that um, this is a partnership between BPC and Aspen that will continue. We're gonna be having a second event in several weeks where we will be focusing on some of the recommendations uh, that Colette along with Rick Santorum and John Delaney, Bobby Jindal, Julian Castro, and Bill Truix put together, kind of a similar directionally uh, correct approach to the same challenge. Um, but the real request is here to start a, start a movement, a hard, difficult conversation about how to actually scale success. And I think the Aspen Institute deserves just a tremendous amount of credit for getting this discussion going. And I thank you all for uh, spending about 90 minutes with us. So more to follow. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>